Thank you, Antoinette. Yeah, um, I have to squeeze in my presentation so I, I don't run too, too quickly through it. Um, when Vian initially asked me to, to talk today, he said, can I say something about logistics and, uh, and the port specifically? And then in the meantime, um, you know, the topic, topic uh, changed quite a bit uh, to what you see on, on the screen there. And I thought, what the hell am I going to say for half an hour on this? Um, but it's much the same as, as logistics these days. The goalposts have shifted and we have to adapt um, to be relevant and competitive. So some of you have seen this slide. It's the only one I'm going to repeat again. Um, but this basically depicts, uh, I think, a lot, large part of the stone fruit season, as well as table grapes, and as well as the early um, pears, as well as apples, in terms of logistics and, and getting your fruit to the market. So uh, the words that come up is disappointment, frustration, um, anger, and then moog rechtsboer. And so as one of the speakers yesterday said, it's hard for. Um, I think there is an adequate word for, for, for the feeling at the moment in terms of where logistics is at and, and where we are heading at. Um, and then at the bottom, um, one of the logistical service providers mentioned to ask Antoinette and myself one day, it seems like you guys are, are suffering from battle fatigue. So it hasn't been easy the last two seasons. Um, let's take it back a bit. Um, so the history of our export industry in the late 1880s, uh, the person, gentleman there at the right top, uh, Percy Montgomery, made the first attempts to export fruit to, to England. Mm -hmm. And in 1892, the first consignment of peaches uh, was sent to Covent Garden Market in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, those peaches reached two shillings and three pennies per peach. And then subsequent to that, uh, 100, cubic meet, uh, yeah, 100 cubic meters of fruit was shipped in that same season. So it's over 130 years of experience that we have in the export business. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot to learn. And then at the right bottom there, um, what's his name again? Uh, Harry Pixton. So then all the tech came in, in terms of cultivars and improving um, uh, the, live, uh, the lifespan of fruit that we do ship and export. So logistics should and used to be straightforward. Uh, we didn't worry about all the stuff in between. US growers and technical people looked after that part. The exporters did the marketing and the in-between in part happened. But it's definitely not the case anymore. Um, it's actually a minefield that we have to traverse these days. Um, so definitely the, um, the goalposts have shifted and it's become way more difficult. Um, so in terms of, again, coming back to where our focus used to be, also from a research side is with the grower, uh, with the orchard and then the pack house, and then also looking at, at cold storage. Um, after that, the market came, came by, as well as um, the consumers, and a lot of effort that went into those parts as well. But over time, of course, our consumers also changed quite rapidly. If you look at uh, especially apples and pears, our main markets have shifted away from Europe, UK, into Africa, into the Middle East, as well as the Far East. Stone fruit's still very um, dependent on, on our European markets, but that should also probably change in the near future. So those two parts, again, what we are focused on. Then the importer side and the retail side came as well, the markets with, with all its demands. And then what we've been busy the last couple of years, actually since COVID, has been this middle part, um, and it's been really challenging in terms of, of addressing those, those issues. So just a, a number of key macro environmental risks that we have identified um, from an industry association side. One is the political instability, uh, an unstable and risky global and trading environment. Then also social instability, unrest and disruption that's a real risk and, and growing and festering. I'm going to talk about infrastructure on the next slide. Then, of course, climate change and the impact that has on our production, um, the use of new technology, and the fourth indust uh, industrial revolution, uh, globalization that's on the back foot, as well as uh, economic challenges globally, as well as, as locally. And then uh, science-based market access, and science is a brief, uh, well, in inverted commas there, and that refers to globalization that's on the back foot. 
and uh, countries and markets closing up not on science-based evidence but purely on politic, uh, well, political influence as well as protecting their own growers and own markets. Then the ethical trade and environmental sustainability on the next slide as well. And then back locally again, uh, black economic empowerment and employment equity. That's our topic again until the elections come next year. So a lot of macro things to worry about. Then a couple of new, new things to worry about. Um, logistics I've mentioned, uh, failing infrastructure, uh, water quality and availability. That, has, uh, that bomb has burst at the last couple of weeks, although we as irrigation growers have been struggling with that in, in certain areas for quite a number of, of years already. Then the com compliance cost, the pressure that the retailers specifically put on us from an ethical and an environmental side, and the one wanting to be better than the other one from a marketing perspective. Then um, in terms of agrochemicals, uh, you always refer to the tools in our toolbox. Uh, the pressure globally on, on the use of, of chemistry, and then, of course, uh, also the pressure on, on your MRLs, um, certain of them completely unfounded, and again, by certain markets and retailers used as uh, an unfair um, marketing tool. And then, uh, of course, the ever-changing commercial requirements, um, the fruit spec, the size, the packaging, etc. And then, on the phytosanitary and, and special market side, uh, the pressure in terms of being able to comply with special markets like Taiwan, USA, Mexico, etc., just to be able to export to those markets. So we had to get our hands dirty. Um, we were forced to get involved in issues, and we, I mean all of us, uh, in issues that we haven't and shouldn't be involved in. Uh, but we have realized from industry side a couple of years ago already that this is Africa, and uh, the sooner we make peace with it and get our hands dirty, the better and we can move on. But one of our main challenges is we need to be afforded the opportunity and space to take charge and ownership of certain functions, like, for instance, the port, which is still a, a, a huge problem. So for you as growers and specifically technical people and marketeers, um, to look into the crystal ball into the future, what, where, who, wanneer, what moet ik wanneer, waar je stier, which is a huge, huge challenge. And uh, coming back to the chemicals and the, uh, the chemistry, which tools can I use to be able to serve a certain markets, but not um, inhibit me from, from accessing other markets? And then, of course, it's a huge investment from a grower's side. So your return on investment versus the risk you take in establishing an orchard that would hopefully give returns over 20 years plus. But then saying all of that, the macroeconomic and all the other new challenges I, I mentioned, I moet jullie nog eindelijk maar net die vruchten produceren. Dat is eindelijk wat ons moet doen. So uh, still have to grow the fruit and, and, and take care of all the other issues as well. So Antoinette mentioned that um, I'm half, well, kind of a half breed between agriculture, economics, and, and horticulture. Uh, this is always an interesting quote for me, and it comes back to, to the crystal ball that you have to look into to try and predict the future and where production and the markets are heading, um, which says an economist is an expert who will know tomorrow why the things he predicted yesterday didn't happen today, um, which yeah, I think speaks to the big challenges in terms of making decisions now, which, which will have an impact long term on your business. So it's all in the detail. Um, of course, big differences between stone fruit and palm fruit uh, in terms of the timing, the window, the perishability of the products, the cultivars, the microclimates, and uh, again, coming back to the commercial demands, uh, which varies substantially between markets and even within markets. And then if you talk palm fruit, for instance, or pears, big difference between summer pears and winter pears. Summer pears, almost, you can group with, with stone fruit and table grapes as, as a way of, of handling and treating them. So I'm going to use plums as an example. Um, the decision you have to make is, do I go in early? Do I go in late? Do I go into the middle? Um, what will logistics be? Um, and where should I fit in into that biggest, bigger picture? 
not just on my farm and what, what I can grow properly and good and in some cases easy, but how does it fit into the bigger picture? And um, looking at the future, where are we headed? With the tree sensors information at hand, um, we try and predict what will happen in the future. I'm just taking plums again as an, as an example. Uh, the green line at the bottom there, that's about, what's it, 17 years back. Our inspections pass for exports, so basically our supply curve. And then if you look at the black line, that is our medium term projection where our plum volumes will be heading. Um, so jumping from last year's or this year's 13.6 million cartons to 18 million cartons. Um, and again, how will you fit into that picture and where will you fit into those peaks? And not just within plums, but I'll get to, to the bigger picture in a couple of, of slides. Then looking uh, a bit broader and wider than, than locally, um, where do we fit in with that picture in terms of the southern hemisphere? And where do we compete with a chili on stone fruits, with a New Zealand um, on, on apples, um, and uh, with a Argentina on pears in, in certain markets? And then, of course, also the northern hemisphere stocks. Um, with stone fruit, the beginning at the end of the season is, is, is crucial, but with uh, apples and pears, it's the carryover stock and the amount of apples and pears in cold storage and how quickly that sells and, and how we fit into that bigger picture. So just coming back to the, the southern hemisphere picture. So yeah, I've, I've mentioned it. This is Chile's uh, plum exports to all markets. Um, South Africa, the red at the bottom. Chile, the black line. So you can see the big difference there. Of course, different markets that they do service, and a lot of it goes to, to Southern America, as well as to Eastern markets like China, where you talk uh, sugar plums. So that was uh, a couple of seasons ago. And if you look at this season, um, you could see the big peaks there. Um, and that was mainly shipments to, to China. So we have to navigate our way from a local perspective as well as an international supply and demand perspective. Then bringing it back home again, so there's also a lot of competition amongst ourselves. And in many cases, we are our worst enemy as well, um, trying to outcompete each other in terms of, of shelf space and market share, etc. Um, also, the difference between regular atmosphere and controlled atmosphere, and also the use of technology when it comes to, um, like, for instance, smart fish on, on stone fruit and widely used on, on apples and pears as well. Um, I was in Cirrus two days ago at one of the big pack houses, and they are starting to talk about what will our strategy be for next year in terms of the cost of generators and diesel. Is it not better to try and sell as many fruit as early as possible versus the cost of storing them at these huge costs um, for months on end? Yeah, and then again, coming back to our, our own strategy from a grower exporter perspective, industry perspective, um, and also keeping the collective strategy in mind as a supplying country. Um, I think that's, that's important to, to have both of them in your planning. Okay, not five minutes. Okay, so coming to logistics, um, we were let down again, um, similar to last year. There was, it were additional equipment that was put in place, cranes and short tensioners, etc. Uh, repairs and maintenance contracts were put in place, which weren't in place at the, in the previous season. But to be quite honest, it wasn't enough and it wasn't good enough. Um, it wasn't quickly enough. And specifically, the promises made to us, myself and Antoinette, we look like fools these days because we are the messengers from Transnet to the industry. Um, those promises couldn't be, be, be kept. And the recovery plans after delays simply didn't happen. So from a logistical perspective, accountability remains a big problem. Um, insight into our industry remains a problem. Um, and what we need to do is take charge again. Uh, we need to change our approach and strategy as a collective, as well as individuals. And where we can take control and start pushing for more control throughout the, the supply and value chain. But the reality is the wind. Um, if you look at those uh, yellow bars, those are the wind delays in hours for January and February. 
um, for February, we had 75 more percent wind this year versus February last year. And if you calculate the amount of hours we lost in Feb, and you add a couple of hours this way and that way in terms of, of shutting down and starting up again in the Cape Town port, this is for Cape Town, um, then it's close on 40% of February that the port was closed. So that, of course, makes a huge impact on the ability to, to ship fruit. Now, if you gave these slides to a statistician or somebody that doesn't understand the industry at all, they would say, well, it's easy. Why don't you just export in this window? <laughs> um, and, <laughs> yeah, ironically, in our initial meetings with Transnet starting last year, when we started getting behind, they said, but uh, is the season just going to be a bit later then? I'm just going to carry on later. Um, so no insight into the perishability of the products that we work with. So coming back to the bigger picture again. So if you take those two months, uh, January and February, which is critical for, for the kickoff and uh, stone table grapes and uh, the early apples and pears, um, so that bluish block represents those two months. Uh, the different bars here are stone fruit, bone fruit, and table grapes. So you can see those windy months, January and February, is slap bang in the middle of our peaks. Um, so we need to plan for those. We need to do something different in the coming season. Um, we expect crops to be up substantially. Um, table grapes, all the fruit types were down this season, probably 10, 15 million cartons. So if we had 10, 15 million more, it would have been a complete disaster. And then, of course, those, that, that graph depicts uh, packed for export, not, not actual shipments. And what you don't want is this erratic supply or arrivals. So this depicts um, plum arrivals into Europe. Um, and you don't want this up and down. You want a relatively stable uh, supply that you can manage the market and don't have under or oversupply in certain, certain windows or certain weeks. So from a post-harvest and research perspective, um, transit times have changed the game completely. Um, cold chain management is critical uh, to monitor what's happening, as well as to have visibility into what's happening in those containers is, is crucial. And then also, with the monitoring and visibility, um, that gives you an early insight and an early warning system in terms of management of, of fruit already packed. Then on to phytosanitary and market access. Um, again, just an example. Uh, this is for, for stone fruit. So this is for the end of the season. We had 16% more interceptions. This is only at PPCB level on fruit fly for stone fruit. Uh, we started the season off way high. I think it was 114% initially on false codling moth that the growers and technical people were able to pull back a bit, so still high, but we ended similar on last year. And ironically enough, um, plums, which isn't regulated in the EU for false codling moth, was the main culprit. So linking that to what has happened in the last two weeks with Taiwan, we had two consignments, um, two codling moth larvas that were found alive in Taiwan. And within the space of three days, that market closed down completely and immediately. Um, we did a rough calculation, and we think it's about in the region of 75 to 100 million rand that we as industry is losing due to that interception. Two days ago, we also had an interception of uh, oriental fruit moth for the first time. Uh, the Mexican inspector found, found it in South Africa here. Um, so that is also causing further challenges for us. So the systems approach, uh, our in-house management um, for, for fruit fly, false codling moth, you can pretty much name any pest and disease is, is crucial. Um, to get by PPCB or by the pack house is not a target. Um, we, we have to take it seriously, otherwise we're going to lose more markets and we can really not afford any losses. So um, Taking ownership, uh, I think the days of grower involvement, responsibility ending at the pack house where you deliver your fruit and that's it, you don't care anymore, you just wait for the money to come in, uh, come in at the end of the season, I think that's over. Um, we cannot just pick back and send and hope for the best. Um, as I said, 
these regulations and risk management systems are not a, a target to just try and get by, uh, passed by. We, we have to take it seriously. We have to measure us moet meet om te weet en as jy meet en jy tel moeilikheid op, moet nou nie dit net weggooi nie. Ok. Ek dink my prentjes is redelijk klaar, so ek is hier op die einde amper, maar ek gaan maar aanpraat. Um, this one actually is, I think it's the last graph, yes. Um, it just depicts the, uh, the margin and how small the margin has become um, from an economic reality perspective. Um, daar is nie my vet ingebouw nie. Um, ons gaan dier een moeilike tyd en um, dit maak het soveel meer uitdagend om, om kop boe water te hou. Ok, daar is my screen nog nie dood. Ok, jy sê weer terug. Ok, then um, on to um, Energy, I think I must say something about energy be be before we move on. Um, I think the, the energy crisis and the impact, sorry, I haven't been here this morning, so I hope I don't repeat anything, but the impact that the energy crisis um, is having on, on pre-harvest, on irrigation, on production, on size, on tree and fruit health is, is something new. Um, on post-harvest, uh, the impact, uh, the removal of yield heat, of course, the ability to keep or cool down and, and keep fruit cool, the cost associated to that that I alluded to, and then the ability to pack in time. Um, this year we did, we had water, uh, warmer loadout temperatures, but what does that mean at the end in terms of, of claims and quality? And then coming back to the cold treatment markets, um, take again Mexico as an example, a 45-day land-based cold treatment um, it really makes it difficult to, to, to get to that with all the load shedding around. And then also the, the availability of, of packaging material, um, the suppliers and manufacturers of packaging material, and the cost associated with load shedding was a, was a major issue. Okay, so, so what now? Um, basically the summary. Um, I think the message from our side is be involved and informed. Um, it's just as important beyond your farm gate, beyond the packhouse door, as inside or on your farm. Um, have clear short, medium and long term strategies in terms of, of where you are heading. Um, crisis management in the short, short term and then your, your medium and long term outlooks and, and plans. And work with your service providers. Um, these people are experts in their fields. Um, so be involved and be informed. Also ask the, the right questions, um, both ways, from a grower to technical people, from technical people to exporters, from exporters to growers, have a plan in mind and, and, and work out that plan collectively. Um, do not take chances and roll the dice, please. Um, we have so much issues in opening up markets and then when we lose them it's, it's just so much more difficult to, to get back into them. And then I think um, for the next season, um, we will do everything from our side to, to improve things from a logistical perspective. Uh, but I think we should plan for the worst and, and hope for the best. Um, and then again, coming back to be involved, be informed, complete that circle from your farm to the consumer, who is the person who finally puts your fruit in his or her, th her mouth. Okay, uh, that's my story. Thank you.